Well, good day to you and welcome back. Well, I've covered a lot of typewriters on this channel, but I've also covered calculating machines of different kinds. Of course, I think the abacus is the one type of calculating machine I've covered the most. But there is a connection between typewriters and calculating machines. And that is in the brand called Marchant. Marchant was an American calculating machine manufacturer. And in the early 1960s, I believe, they were bought out by Smith Corona. So if you have a 1960s or later Smith Corona typewriter, it's probably branded as an SCM, and the M on that is Marchant, the calculator company. This is a pinwheel style calculating machine, a mechanical calculating machine from the 1920s. It was a recent gift to me from my good friend Bill, and I thought it would be fun to look at this, see how it works, and do some calculations with it. Stay tuned. Well, this calculator is heavy. It weighs about 15 pounds, so as much as a medium-sized portable typewriter, despite its fairly small size. Um, it had originally some uh, round feet on the bottom that were all squished flat. I had some spare rectangular-shaped typewriter feet that I put on here. If you get one of these, you'll probably find that the base is going to be rubbing on the table, so just be careful of that. It has a case, and the case is this big thing, and it has a spring clip, a pair of spring clips that engage into a slot on the right side of the base, so you kind of fit the cover something like that, and then it snaps into place, and there was originally a leather strap. I wouldn't trust it. This thing is so heavy, I wouldn't be carrying it by anything other than the bottom. Uh, if that clip ever came loose, it would be disastrous for the machine. But anyways, let's take the case off again. So I took this apart, cleaned it, degreased it, re-lubricated it, and put a little wax on the outside finish of it. And it's in surprisingly good shape for the age of it, and it works pretty darn good. Well, on the bottom of the base of the machine, it says XLA-1588. 1588 is the serial number, and XLA is the model. So the basic way this pinwheel calculator works is you have these setting levers up here, and the number that you set each lever to determines the number of teeth that are going to be on the pinwheel, or the number of pins that protrude out. And, for instance, if I set this to three, there will be three pins protruding. And then if I rotate the operating handle clockwise, one full revolution, it'll record that number right here on the corresponding column on the product scale. And, at the same time, this position indicator, the column that the position indicator is at, will tell you how many times it's been rotated in the clockwise direction. So I've entered three once. If I turn the operating handle a second time, you'll see that now it registered six and I've turned it twice. Now you might be able to determine there's a relationship between these three and this is actually multiplication and division, right? So six divided by two is three or three times two is six. And that's the basis for how you can multiply. But what gives it a lot more power is the fact that you have a carriage shifting lever. You can move the carriage in respect to the operating lever columns. You can also do it by hand. And this gives you the ability to move around and move your numbers and, and multiply and divide them into different rows. When you want to clear the numbers, you turn the clearing handle clockwise to clear the product register and you turn it counterclockwise to clear the what's called the proofing dial. And then if you raise up this lever here, you can clear all the setting levers. Let me show you a basic a series of addition problems. So I'm going to move the carriage so that the position indicator is over the position 1 of the proofing dial. And then I'm going to input a number, let's say 245, like that. And then I'm going to turn the handle one full stroke. And you'll see right there. And then we'll input... 3,275. I'm doing this upside down, anyways. There we go. And then we're going to go 84, 84, like that. And the answer is 
3,604. And you'll notice that the proving dial shows I input three numbers. In other words, I turn the operating handle three rotations, so I input three numbers, and the sum total is shown right here in the product dial, 3,604. Let's do a subtraction problem. So I'm reading this upside down, by the way. So 24,567. So then we're going to turn the crank once, and that will enter the number into there. Now we're going to clear the numbers. We're going to set up 13,245. And then we're going to turn the lever in the counterclockwise of subtraction direction. So the answer, 11,322, shows here, and you'll notice the numbers here on the proofing dial are zero because we entered one number, 24,567, and when we entered it, it incremented this to one, and then when we subtracted the second number, it ran this in the reverse direction. So it shows zero here and the answer to our subtraction problem here. Okay, now we're going to talk about multiplication. And so multiplication on these machines is basically repetitive addition. But when you have more than a single digit multiplier, you shift the carriage over. And so you can actually multiply larger numbers together quite easily. But let's do a real simple one. Let's go 13 times 4. So I just entered 13 here. And I'm just simply going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. And the number of rotations here is 4, and our answer is 52. But now suppose we had a multi-digit problem. Let's say instead of 13 times 4, we had 13 times 24. Well, we've already done the 13 times 4, so if we move the register over, now we can multiply by the 20 simply by going 1, 2. And now the product shows as 312, and you can see on the proofing dial that we've multiplied by 24. So this becomes really easy to multiply larger numbers together simply by moving the carriage over for each digit of the multiplier. And you really can multiply quite fast on this with bigger numbers. So there's a shortcut method for multiplying by larger numbers. So for instance, I'm going to have this problem of 3,674. 3, 6, 7, 4. Okay, I'm going to multiply by 199. So normally I would crank this one turn, move it over, crank it nine times, and then move it over again and crank it nine times. That will be 19 cranks of the lever. But instead of that, I'm gonna go over two spaces and I'm gonna crank it just two times, which means I'm multiplying by 200. One, two. Then I'm gonna go back to the units position and reverse crank it by just one, which is subtracting one from 200 which is like multiplying by 199, and the answer is 731126. So this is a way of reducing the number of cranks you have to do by complementary arithmetic, if you will. So when you're multiplying two numbers together, it's helpful to enter the number that has the larger sum of its digits onto the pins first, and then multiply by the number that has a smaller sum of its digits. So let's say we have the number 5281, and we're gonna multiply by 245. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, and one, two. And that gives us one, two, nine, three, eight, four, five. We did it with the fewest number of cranks of the machine by using the multiplier whose sum of its digits is the smaller of the two values. And also, you notice the order in which I entered the multiplier. I entered it from the units column first, then the tens column, then the hundreds column. You can do it in either order because multiplication is distributive in that sense. So I just did it from right to left. You could do it from left to right. It doesn't matter. Okay, so we're going to do a division problem. This is going to be a four-digit problem, 9,872, 9,872. 
of 74 divided by 24. So we want this example to be accurate to within six decimal points. So I've put my units here on the decimal point to the left of the sixth place here. So I'm going to enter the number. So here you can see 9874. And then I'm going to clear this dial. I'm going to clear this. Now we're going to enter the 24. You have to start by subtracting from the left side or the greater part of the number first. So 24 is going to go here. And now I need to decide where to put the decimal point for our answer. So we have six decimal points here, and we actually have two more decimal points here. So 6 minus 2 is 4, so I'm going to set my decimal point, and the quotient will be right here. And you'll notice the numbers will start being entered on column 7, and the decimal point will be here. So this will be in the hundreds, magnitude-wise. Okay, so all that to say we have 24 entered on the pins. All we have to do is repetitive subtraction until this goes lower than the uh, 24. And you can see it goes to 9s and rings a bell. When that happens, we just reverse back again like that. We go to the next decimal point and start turning again. If it goes to nines, flip it back to the next decimal point. The next one. Back. The next one. The next one. Back there, the next one, and we are at the limit of our resolution here. So the answer of 9,872 divided by 24 is 411.4166, and I think the 66 repeats itself. Now, if we wanted greater precision, we could have started over so that the answer begins out here on the very left, the ninth column of this indicator. But we have a pretty good quotient right there. So now here's another division problem that's kind of a lot of fun to do. Let me clear off our registers here. We're going to start in the very left column here. So we're going to do 355 divided by 113. So here's our 355. We clear this out. And now we enter 113. Now this fraction, 355 divided by 113, is an approximation of pi, which is very interesting. So let's figure out where our decimal point is going to be. 10 decimal points up here minus the 2 up here for the 113. That 10 minus 2 is 8. So there's where the decimal point will be. Okay, we're just going to do repetitive subtraction, and we overflow the register. We reverse turn it and move off to the next. Okay, move to the next one. Okay, move to the next one. Okay, move to the next one. All right. One forty six. I know that's going to overflow, so I go to the next register. One thirteen is bigger than that. One more. Okay, one more. And that's the resolution of this. 3.14159292. So that's a pretty good approximation of pi, out to maybe four or five decimal points. So the history of the pinwheel calculator uh, goes all the way back to 1685, when Leibniz, the famous mathematician, invented an initial prototype, or at least he designed one on paper, that was then later built. And there were a number of inventors in the subsequent centuries who kind of reinvented the pinwheel calculator in various forms. Uh, I think some of the German companies probably 
were the first to put them on the market. And Marchant was a U.S. company that copied a lot of the features from the earlier German machines. So there were a lot of other business types of calculations that you could do on these calculating machines, like markup and percentages and repeat multiplication by constants, et cetera, et cetera. Also, there is a method online of how to do square roots on these mechanical calculators. It's a complicated procedure, and I don't want to cover it in this video, but I'll leave a link down below if you're interested in that. And also, I can imagine around the time of World War II here in northern New Mexico, there were probably rooms full of people operating machines very similar to this, running the complex calculations for the design of the atomic bombs during the Manhattan Project. So the pinwheel type of mechanism where the setting of the lever determines how many teeth project from the wheel, that mechanism evolved into a stepping wheel mechanism that was then operated by a row of keys. So instead of having a lever you move here, you had columns of keys, 0 through 9, and when you push a key in a column, it basically is going to set the stepping wheel to move that many teeth, if you will. And those machines originally were hand-cranked, similar to the way this one is, but then they became motorized. And so you had machines that look like mechanical adding machine, but they're actually calculators. They have a moving carriage, and they have the two different registers, the product register and the indicator register, and they're motorized. And so those machines would do very much the same kind of thing as here. Uh, repeated addition for multiplication, repeated subtraction for division. And they often had, the, the more advanced ones had a button. You just push the multiply button and it would sit there and crank it with a motor that number of times. So what was a hand-operated machine ended up becoming more of an automated machine. But as you've seen, things like multiplication and division are actually very rote and mechanical, and there's really not that much thinking required. You basically enter your one number, clear the register, enter your other number, and then you crank it until the bell rings, reverse crank it, step it over one position, crank it again until the bell rings, reverse crank it once, keep going. So it's very mechanical and not really much brain power needed, which is good if you're running a long series of complicated calculations. Uh, it's easy to crank these out. The, really the trickiest part of the whole operation is figuring out where your decimal points go in your answer. If you have any questions, drop a note down below. I'd love to discuss with you these wonderful old calculating machines. And until next time, stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.